I'm excited to be sharing this work because um, it's really the first time I've had a chance to share this. Um, and I'll be talking today about extending the reach of UK biobank data into the mitochondrial genome. Um, now, there may be some words in there that are um, that are challenging you, um, but I want to make clear that the data structure that we're working on that is, is really makes the project really accessible. And there's no complex maths and the genetics are simple. Um, so just a little bit about the talk structure. I'm going to talk about um, why we're looking at mitochondria and why we're looking at mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, uh, and UK Biobank's data um, and the constraints that that introduces. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about um, how we've got around those constraints and tried to um, overcome those constraints. And then finally, I'm going to give you some of our results. Um, so mitochondria are an integral part of the cell and you can consider them as domesticated bacteria. People have called them domesticated bacteria and they enabled multi the move to multicellular life. So they're hosted in nearly all cells with a nucleus, um, animals, plants and fungi, uh, which makes them, you know, pretty vital and worth studying, I think. Um, they are connected with other cellular pathways, but they provide their big function is to provide this 15, about 15 fold increase in yield of usable energy for the hosting cells. So they're, they're referred to as the energy powerhouse for the cell. Um, and of course, if you are a mitochondrion and you improve things, things in the cell that much, you can't rest and you can't fail. Uh, when that cell calls for the energy, you have, it has to be there. So the thing that they've retained, uh, most, most of their genes have been relocated to the nucleus, but a very, they've retained a, a tiny genome of about 15,500 base pairs. So 16,500 uh, A's, T's, C's and G's. <clears throat> so not, it's not a big genome at all. Um, however, um, and I love this quote, it's from Nick Lane's book, Power, Sex and Suicide, which is also a very good title. Um, the equivalent, uh, so having their own genome is the equivalent to storing a valuable library in the wooden shack of a registered pyromaniac. And I think this quote is lovely and dramatic, but it also captures... Um, how the information on this genome is vital for function, and that's functioning of the mitochondrion and um, functioning of the cell and the individual. And this genome is stored in this dangerous chemical soup, um, and it's a chemical soup made by the mitochondrion itself. Um, so given all these uh, awful, dangerous um, circumstances, despite that, evolution hasn't found a way to store these last few genes in the nucleus. Um, so why are we looking at mitochondrial DNA? So we went over to why we're going to look at mitochondria because they're vital. Um, why are we looking at mitochondrial DNA? So this dangerous soup is producing a really high mutation rate of about 10 times that of nuclear DNA. Um, so we're talking about about 50% of the genome bases don't agree they're, they've got some, we, we find individuals with changes on about 50% of the genome bases, which is much higher, um, much, much higher than the nuclear uh, DNA. It's inherited um, down the maternal line. So you get your mother's uh, mitochondrial DNA and uh, you see no, no evidence of your father's at all. Um, and there's no evidence of um, a process called recombination, which is a genetic sort of stirring action, which keeps um, genes healthy, nuclear genes healthy, but we don't see it in the mitochondrial DNA. Um, and this process, these, these three factors, add up to what is a very beautiful family tree. So um, we've got these, these are, these are the big branches of the human family tree. Um, and they can be traced up. You can trace up through to um, a mitochondrial a theoretical and mitochondrial Eve, who um, uh, from from whom we uh, we descend. Uh, it's worth saying that whilst there are these forty or so um, branches, these actually hide about five thousand branchlets, um, little groups which groups of uh, individuals which are similar. 
which are very, very similar or hold the very same sequence. Um, and these groups and the pattern and the structure and the family tree can be traced through the differences in mitochondrial DNA that we see. I wanted to also give you not only the uh, family tree, but a map of the, the uh, mitochondrial DNA. So um, I wanted to show you that 93% um, of the genome is coding. So please don't imagine, although it's short, please don't imagine that you know, it's full of spacer DNA or, or gaps or things. This is really, really heavily loaded um, with, with genes and important information. So that library is absolutely packed. Uh, there's no uh, copies of uh, Vogue magazine in the corner taking up space. It's all, it, it's all, um, it's all genetic material. Uh, the grey um, portions aren't, um, we're saying aren't, there aren't gaps. Uh, they're uh, tRNA genes. Two, the only thing that isn't, um, the only portion that isn't uh, uh, coding DNA is that teal loop at the top. Um, and that's pretty vital for function. So um, it is, but it's it, it's <laughs> it's all very important. So um, we find that some of these differences that we see, uh, these these differences we see down the family tree, actually cause pathologies. So in red on this map, we've got some examples of pathologies. Now I won't expect you to know all NARP and MRF and Lahon, um, but the um, I wanted to include them because uh, you get some idea of, of what, what we expect from a uh, broken, empty DNA. Uh, and, and what we see is problems in tissues with a high metabolic demand. So we get problems in, you know, in neurons, we get neuropathies, we get problems in muscles, so myopathies, um, liver problems and diabetes and lots of others. And these are, you know, strong variables that we see, um, we see, but highly penetrative um, uh, genetic variants. However, what we hypothesized with this project is there'll be a, a layer underneath of, um, of many more variants which correlate or associate it with certain health conditions of aging. So things that um, are a little more subtle than these red, these red um, pathologies. So we're, you know, we're wondering that maybe we have a variant that needs some sort of stressor to be triggered. Um, so, yeah, so we may, maybe only see these variants in times of stress. So if we had an example, uh, we had a, a, a time of hypoxia, maybe a um, heart muscle problems, uh, you end up with hypoxia and that triggers this, uh, this, this, this triggers this condition. It reveals this variant or maybe with certain certain illnesses, or in combination with um, nuclear variants, which cause, you know, maybe subperformance of the cell, that then in combination with this variant, we see a condition. Um, so these are going to be subtle, and they're going to depend on other factors. So they won't be, not every person with this particular variant will be seen with this condition, because it also needs in combination with this, this stress. Um, so we need, what do we need to study them? We need uh, lots of people with their lots of people and um, lots of medical history and we need to need to know lots about their um, uh, mitochondrial genomes. The UK Biobank certainly provides lots of people <laughs> they've got half a million people recruited um, uh, and they have lots of medical history so these these are they've got the medical histories of all these half a million people and their family medical histories as well. Um, we do need to do a little bit of excavation, excavation and um, a bit of work to get hold of as much mitochondrial DNA uh, information as we can. Because UK Biobank's approach um, was a fact, factored in by the time um, that the project uh, um, approached the DNA. So um, at the time it was far too much money to uh, sequence each member and they needed big numbers. They wanted lots of people. So they took a kind of middle road. Um, they weren't sequenced, so we don't know the exact, uh, all the ATs, Cs and Gs in a, in a row of, uh, of these people. Um, but UK Bank, Biobank chose a small number of informative positions that knowing the data on the, in these positions using a microarray like, like we see at the bottom of the, the uh, frame there, um, would tell us a lot more about the genome 
than just that one position. We could infer a great deal. This is a process called genotyping. Um, and the data is pretty crude from them. So uh, it gives us the option to check for a particular reference sequence. So um, uh, it, you know, we're checking a particular position. We're expecting the reference with the reference uh, sequence expect T. So we can look for a T. Or we can look for one particular other base. We can look for an alternative. Um, the example I'm going to give is, is a G. So we can look for a T and its reference. We can look for a G, and if we find a G, it's a particular alternative. We can also return, it can also return an answer of unknown. So maybe there's a C here, um, which doesn't register. It's certainly not reference, it's not alternative. We're going to give an unknown answer. Um, one other thing that can happen is if there's a variant close to the position that it's checking, it can jam the signal. We can get a signal jam and we get an unknown despite the fact there may well be an alternative signal. So this unknown overrides the reference alternative call in this case. So this boils down to um, UK Biobank holding information on, uh, on about 240 positions in this 16 and a half thousand base pairs. Um, and we need to bring that back up. We need to, so we've got information about 240 positions and we need to come to thousands. We need to, we need to bring that back up to thousands. Uh, so current uh, methods of doing this with, uh, use the inheritance patterns of nuclear DNA. Um, and that's not optimal. We talked about the differences between nuclear DNA and uh, mitochondrial DNA inheritance patterns. Um, and there's mixed news here. So, um, uh, so the mutation rate of mitochondrial DNA is obviously much hard. It makes makes it makes the problem harder. Um, but we can we can build a model that doesn't have to include that genetic mixing that we talked about that kept the genome healthy. That, you know, it's a big source of um, uh, change that we just don't need to think about. We don't need to include in our model. So we need another route, and I'm going to present here my alternative method. <clears throat> so we're going to use a, a, a library of um, a full sequence data, uh, of training data, to inform the guesses that we make of what might be in the in between these 240 positions. We're going to fill in the gaps. Um, uh, we're going to take each uh, UK Biobank sample with their 240 bits of information and then find clusters of library samples which would have produced the same 240 bits of information had they been genotyped. Um, and the place we're going for the training data um, is, the, is, the, is GenBank. We're going to get a big library of training data um, of about 50,000 complete sequences from all over that, that tree. Um, and we're going to compare. We're going to we're going to find matches. It's worth saying here that we built this. We it was inspired and built to deal with UK Biobank data, but we've always focused on the fact that it needed to be more flexible than that, uh, with a different with a different microarray. We can we can predict uh, the results on that. So um, it takes it takes the microarray as part of the input. Uh, so if you've got, if you, if you know of any other data which, which would benefit from this, um, please um, suggest at the end, that would be lovely. So to cover this a little bit in a little bit more depth, um, in silico genotyping. So we need to, we need to find a way to model the genotyping process. Um, and the way we've come up with is is as follows. So we're going to take um, we're going to build a big list of every variant mentioned in any of the library samples. So we'll break the library sample sequence down, and we'll find any variation in them. We'll make this one giant list uh, of all the variants there. And then for each of the two hundred and forty answers that we're questions we're trying to ask, we're going to find a, a small subset of variants which affect that answer. Uh, and then for each of those 
um, those relevant variants, we're going to find the direction that they would they would in uh, they would encourage the microarray to decide. So, and this should be familiar from earlier. Um, so, is the variant does the variant make it uh, make the sequence look like reference? Now, this is uh, by definition this shouldn't happen because a variant isn't the reference. Uh, it shouldn't trigger reference because if it was reference, it wouldn't be mentioned as a variant. Um, but we do check for these. Um, so really, we're looking for um, specific variants which uh, which the microarray was looking for, that one alternative um, variant. The other option is it could be on the locus, so it could be at the position it's looking for, but not the one expected. So that was the that was the G option. Uh, that was the C option. Uh, so it had looked for the T and not found the T. Had it found the uh, it hadn't found a G, as the other one was expected. Uh, it was finding this C option. Um, or again, we find the same thing. We could find this jamming signal. Um, so it's a, it's a variant that's within range and it's jamming the signal. So uh, we can't see whether it's a variant, whether it's a reference or alternative. And again, this needs to override, override the other calls. Um, so with this information, we can make we can take any library library sample uh, and and their complete list of variants uh, and and boil it down to to answer these two hundred and forty questions that the UK Biobank microarray asked. Um, and really importantly here, um, it's it, you need to keep in mind that the identical uh, mitochondrial DNA molecules should have produced the same art set of answers, and whether they were tested. Uh, using the microarray or processed using my method. So we now have a library of training data where we have a genotype answer and, and their complete list of variants that produce that genotype answer. So we've got a lovely bridge between genotyping and full sequence for lots and lots of individuals. <clears throat> now we need to do some pattern matching. So we can take any test data, test sample um, answer. So that's their, the, the test samples, 240 bits of information. And at each of those answers, we're going to try and find matches in this, this way. So, um, you know, reference will, will link to reference, but it'll also have to link to unknown because the unknown may well mask a reference. So we need to be, we need to keep that wobbly, uh, wobbly choice open. Uh, keep it open for that and of course if there's unknowns we need to link through to the the three answers also um this is because we can't tell the difference between an unknown that represents a c and an unknown that represents a jam a signal jam so we have to keep this open for that and it looks like a fairly indiscriminate process um but it's worth keeping in mind that the unknowns whilst more common in the mitochondrial DNA, are still moderately rare. Um, and of course, many of, the, um, many of the unknowns that we see would have been seen in the library, uh, in, um, if, they'd been, if the sample had been genotyped on microarray. So we, we are going to see these answers, these uh, unknown answers. And of course, we've got 240 bits of uh, information, 240 answers to these questions. So... Um, We've got a chance to be to, to narrow our search down, uh, and we end up with we end up with a list of library samples which have produced the same uh, identical or compatible two hundred and forty unit long answers. So we've done some pattern matching. We then can trace the uh, library samples with the compatible patterns back to their full variant lists that they produce. And I've given a bit of an example here, a very simple example, of how we convert those matching sample, those matching library samples uh, and their variant lists. We can, can convert that into a, a weighted prediction for that test, for the test that, that found those matches. So we're gonna build two things to start with. We're gonna build um, a, variant, a list of all the variants we see 
in this subset, subset of um, samples. And then we're going to put, uh, we're going to find proportions or weights for each of those variants with what that reflect the confidence with which we're predicting um, those variants. So um, I'm going to give two examples here. Um, this one, two, three A uh, variant uh, is found in five of the five. So we're going to give a weight of one. Um, and this is what we'd like to see, nice, good, confident calls. And our other example is this uh, 1213T, which is in found in one sample of the, of the five. So we're going to give it a much lower weight. Um, and this adds in some sort of nuance of, uh, of how the predictions we made may be maybe broader or... Um, uh, we aren't deciding yes or no as the variants there. We're going to give a a bit of a, an estimate of how predict how confident we are with making that prediction. So now we can just ride off into the sunset, can't we? We can process our UK biobank participants and find dozens and hundreds of variants which associate with health incomes outcomes uh, and publish papers, and it all be wonderful. <clears throat> it's probably worth keeping in mind that. Um, that big giant list of all the variants that we made at the start of uh, in silico genotyping was 10,000 variants long. And we found only 3% of those variants were in any relevance to these 240 answers asked by the microarray. So we've got an awful lot of variants which had no effect on the answers produced by the microarray. <clears throat> and we're adding 97% of these variants back in uh, in the process of predicting. Um, and I'm certainly not confident enough to uh, to uh, assume that my predictions will be right. Uh, and we don't want bias. We don't want to add in bias. So we're going to check our answers. We're going to check these guesses. And the way that we've done that is uh, is to slightly alter the process. When we make predictions on the UK biobank samples, so when we when we take a UK biobank sample and we make some predictions, we're going to use the whole of the library, all sort of... Uh, nearly 50,000 samples. However, when we check, we're going to split that library into a training set and a test set. It's not an ideal process, but it's where we've started. So, uh, so our test samples are going to be predicted using the training data set. So we've got a set of test predictions. Uh, and the test predictions can be compared against what the true answer should have been. Um, you know, how well has the training set made a prediction? Uh, and we can compare the uh, predicted answers with the actual observed answers. Okay, I wanted to give some simple examples of how we, we um, ascertain how correct things are. Uh, so our first example is, is what we'd like to see. So um, the, this, this top bar is, um, is a list of observed variants. So these are, the, these are the correct variants that we should see. And here we've got the predicted list of variants, and then we've got their corresponding weights. So 123A uh, is in the observed variants, and it's in the predicted variants, so we're correct. And we've given it a weight of 1. We were very confident that we were going to see that. And we were right to be confident, because uh, we were right. And so that point goes into correct. And this is what we want to see. We want to have a, uh, predictions that are weights of one, um, really nice confident predictions or close to one, um, and, uh, and they're correct. So that would be our ideal situation. Um, here we've got a slightly more hesitant match. We're not as sure with four, five, six. We were wrong to be not sure because it's actually there we were correct. So the 0 0.9, our weight, uh, goes into correct. Uh, and uh, the remainder, this remainder, block of remainder, uh, so 1 minus uh, 0 0.9, so 0 0.1 goes into false negative because we were wrong to be reticent about making that prediction. Here we've got an example where we've, we've entirely missed the prediction. We've not predicted 10, 11, uh, C, uh, so the whole of that point goes into a false negative. And our last example is 
where we made a, a hesitant prediction of 789G with a weight of 0.4, and it was wrong. It shouldn't have been there. So the 0.4 goes into a false positive, and the, uh, uh, the remainder of that, so 1 minus 0.4, is correct because we were right to have that hesitancy. So we've got this brews down to a lot of numbers and a lot of data um, comparing things, uh, a lot of weightings that have been processed. We need to gather things together to get a bit of a picture of, of accuracy. Um, uh, and we're going to look at the information in two directions, two ways. Um, we're going to look at it sample wise and variant wise, because looking at it sample wise can give you an idea of, of groups of individuals, of samples that are um, predicted badly. And variant wise, you can see what types of uh, base or what types of variant will be predicted badly too. And both of those will give us clues as to how to improve the algorithm and, and mistakes that we've made. And of course, we need to look at the direction of the errors, the error direction, uh, so false positive or false negative can give us big clues as well. So we're looking for clues on performance and how to improve things. Um, focusing first on um, prediction actually starts uh, sample wise. Um, how accurately were the sample variants predicted, samples variants predicted? We made predictions on 8,982 of the samples. Um, so approximately 10% we were unable to find matches for. Um, these, on exploration, we found that these were largely due to, to sample members. Uh, we couldn't find any particular problems with the process that were triggering these. Um, it was down to the fact that we'd split that library or um, certain things were just too rare to be able to predict. Uh, so we were confident in that. Uh, looking at the accuracy of the um, predicted samples, um, the percentage here represents of how much of that, of that um, the number of variants we could have predicted, how much of that weight we, we can assign to correct. Uh, and we got a score of an average score of 85.3% of that weight we, we can assign as correct. We, we correctly predicted, we recovered with that prediction, which I'm pleased with. Um, but we do need to think about why we got some, which samples were poorly uh, predicted. And one of the, you know, we talked about the ways we could do this sample wise, we could gather. If you remember the, the big family tree and the, and the 40 or so branches, we can, we can gather the samples up via these branches, using these branches on the branches that they sit on. And we do find that there's a certain effect of a sample number in these branches. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, having a low sample number is linked to poor performance. The only one that bucks the trend here is the N2, and that is just uh, just because of a single representative sample, and it's predicted relatively well, um, which I think is more than luck than judgment, uh, and it reflects the volatility of when, when numbers are small. However, samples we can see samples in L4, L5, L6, S and P, um, have performed performed very badly, um, so they need a bit of explanation, a, a bit of exploration. So when we compare the direction of the error that um, that's made with these, we actually see two slightly different patterns. We've got uh, the these three L branches, L four, L five, and L six, are pushed towards false negative. So there's uh, there are variants that are there that should be there but aren't being predicted, and then we've got uh, S and P. Which uh, which represent a high false positive rate, and that's that's because people are it's making it's making predictions of variants that aren't there. Um, so they're behaving; they are behaving differently. 
Um, and they lead us to two, to two uh, conclusions, really, that um, more library sample, sample data will help flesh out, flesh out these predictions for L4, L5 and L6. Um, but it leaves us with a... So we can fix that problem, but there is a problem that we can't, we can't be rectified. Um, there are branches here that are just badly defined by the information gathered by the microarray. Um, so I think S and P are just being misassigned largely. There's not enough detail to reliably put them within the S, you know, the S samples within the S branch and the P samples within the P branch, and it's meaning it's meaning we're getting poor performance for those ones. Um, and we knew this would be the case. This is this is what we what we thought would probably happen, um, and it kind of boils down to does this matter? How big is the effect of this? And, and have we introduced, when we make predictions, do we introduce um, uh, do we introduce problems? Do we introduce bias? Are we introducing a lot of bias? Um, because we want to use this to look for variants which are, low, which are, which are associated with um, conditions. And are we introducing noise into our data that will drown out signal? So we also need to look uh, at the accuracy we see variant-wise. Um, and you remember I talked about there being 10,000 variants. Uh, um, and these variants, um, as I say, they cover, they cover about half the mtDNA's bases. And on average, uh, we saw about 96% of their weight being assigned as correct. So we're really pleased with that. You know, that's a really good... Um, uh, a really good score, uh, given given how much we are guessing. Again, we need to say right. So the weight is the weight is nice up on the right hand side, and and you know we're pleased with that. But we want to say what is familiar, what is common about these samples, and can we correct it? So we were looking at have we introduced bias? Are certain types of variant treated differently? And we explored coding and non-coding, because that seems a very sensible way of starting. Um, and the number of variants on the base pair, we're we trying to predict, say, 21 variants on this base pair and just struggling. Um, we're also looking at kind of what's what's the uh, local region about the um, the variant like? Are we trying to predict in a, in a high level of um, local heterogeneity? The only thing that we came up with which made... Well, None of these produced any, uh, seemed to have any bias, uh, but we found one variable which, which, which was very predictive of significant problems, and that was low variant representation again. Um, if the variant was seen fewer than four times, um, we saw big problems. And I've, uh, I've just shown the ones, I've highlighted the ones in cyan here. Um, to show the uh, the percentage um, which variants poured, uh, were were poor because they were they had this low uh, and had this low weight um, uh, number of variants number of appearances in the uh, in the research. Uh, so we found if we removed. This these these low weight variants that we saw fewer than four times, um, in any of the lists, it uh, it got rid of um, four hundred and sixty three of the five hundred and seventy seven variants uh, that were less than fifty percent. So you can see what a difference that makes. We do lose a few um, better variants, but it's a really good way of cleaning the data. <clears throat> so when we remove those variants. Um, and I think there's a good argument to remove them. Um, uh, we see an improvement, a general, a general, uh, the, the, the mean is pulled up to 95.3%. Um, and as, as our, we're trying to scan for variant prediction, we're going to try and make some, um, we're going to scan variant predictions for association with health conditions. 
in the partitions of the UK Biobank. And I feel like a 95.3% accuracy is acceptable for a, certainly for a first parts attempt <clears throat> at looking for links and associations. So we now can ride off into the sunset um, and make some predictions for the UK Biobank. Uh, so we were able to predict 87% of the UK Biobank samples. And the first thing we could do uh, was compare the reference alternative and unknown call rates. So for each, uh, for each question, each of the 240 questions we ask, are we getting about the number, the right numbers? Um, is it splitting down in, in the proportions that we expect? And we found that mostly it was. Um, the we can see there's there's nine uh, uh, nine data points which were significantly out of this this range, um, but on exploration um, these outliers could largely be explained by the fact that uh, we were the population was different the library population uh, the samples in the library were just a different population, um, and you can see that the the in this case, the alternative rate. So we're seeing more alternatives in uh, participants in the library, which makes sense because this the the library part the the library samples will be less uh, less white and British, and the reference sequence. So all the reference sequence will be uh, are white, from a white British uh, individual. So that does make sense. Uh, So we're pleased with that. Um, I'm afraid I can't show you all the lovely associations that we can do um, because we haven't simply haven't got that far yet. Uh, we've run out of time. Um, but helpfully, um, I'm now going to pass all these predictions over to my back to my supervisor, Dave Clancy. Um, and he's very excited about um, being able to look for um, for prediction, make some predictions, use my predictions to um, look for some associations. Um, with health data, so that's um, that's the thing we're really excited about. Um, thankfully, we've got a, a new group member called Ashley Stokes who is um, going to take the algorithm and improve it because I've run out of time. Um, and a couple of other things that I'd really like to do. Um, you could see this process, this um, uh, this in silico genotyping and, and pattern matching. Uh, and then checking, working in some sort of loop. I can see it working in in, uh, in an improvement loop and iteratively improving the uh, the the loci set that we the uh, the questions that we ask. Um, that would be really pleasing to do. And um, and we would like to expand the use on other data sets to uh, make some predictions on things other than the UK Biobank. So if you can think of some other data sets that would benefit from. Uh, the effective imputation of mitochondrial DNA. We'd like to hear about them. Um, and my last point is just to say thank you to my supervisors, Joe Clancy, Dave Clancy and Joe Knight, and to Ashley Stokes, um, who's the new group member. And they've been asking some really good questions to help um, help me nail down what I, my thoughts and, and my processes. And I want to thank you for listening. <laughs>